and we're welcoming everyone um, here uh, tonight to this uh, event where we are going to discuss uh, the voice um, campaign with three excellent uh, speakers. Um, my name is um, Sarah Howe, Chair of the Nation National Chair of the Australian <laughs> Fabians. Um, we've been um, involved, we're very closely connected as, uh, with the Australian Labor Party, as you would all know, for more than half a century, we've been at the forefront of research and debate into progressive ideas and public policy reform. Uh, we are a, fr a friend of the Labor Party, but a critical friend. So we're um, often, uh, we often run these sort of conversations to try and provoke change within the Labor Party structures uh, and thinking about policy agendas. I want to thank uh, the Yes Campaign here in Tasmania for helping me organise this event. We're very, we're very keen. We haven't run an event in Tasmania for probably over 20 years. Uh, so we're still red building down here. <laughs> we're glad to have our members who are so loyal come along tonight. So thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Rodney Dillon to conduct a welcome to the country. And then I will then introduce the speakers after that. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to acknowledge that these lands are on, uh, our Aboriginal lands, our people's lands. They always have been our lands and they always will be. And I'd like to acknowledge the thought of the impact of colonisation on our people. When they declared war on Aboriginal people in Tasmania, it did have an impact on our people because they killed them. And that's as much impact as colonisation can have on a group of people. So just to acknowledge those people that were shot and killed for their lands who have come before us. And to acknowledge the people that's here today and how we go forward. I think that thinking about how we go forward together as a group of people, put our hand, this is about inclusiveness and talking about how we live together on these lands today. So welcome everyone, welcome to our people's lands and I think we can have a, a good conversation, go away with a bit more information than we can. Thank you. That's right. Thank you very much, Rodney. Um, Fabian Zach, as I said, delighted that you came on here tonight. We've got three excellent speakers as, um, here on the panel. Um, so, Play is that the referendum said we need the support of at least four of the six states. Um, and the overall majority of voters nationally. Um, <coughs> Queensland and WA are not going terribly well. Tasmania is very important in that context. Um, that's why we're down here. And uh, we want to um, interrogate questions to do with the voice um, constitutional change and what it all means. So uh, I am now going to uh, introduce our three uh, speakers. Um, we've just heard from Rodney Dillon. He will be speaking um, first. Uh, so um, I don't think he needs any more introduction, but I will say that he's the chairperson of the Aboriginal Heritage Council member of the numerous, numerous high-level boards, including National Oceans, the Australian Heritage Council, Stolen Generations, and Commission of the Aboriginal, and he was Commission of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Commission. So I'm going to hand over to him to speak uh, first, and then I'll introduce the other speakers. Thank you for that. Yeah, but most <laughs> of my life, when I was a young boy, my mum took me up to the graveyard at Sigmund see one of my great grandmothers, Grandmother Smith. And we always thought that Grandmother Smith was a pretty famous person. She sang a song in language in the museum. And anyone knows, and she got land back in 1885, I think it was Ruben. Uh, she was one of the first kids born at Waibalina. Uh, so she had a lot of, she carried a lot of value in our family and had a lot of who we was as people. So we always had a great fondness of this old lady because she built a church down the road and, and uh, 
She had this land handed back. So she, she had a, a lot of responsibility in our family to us as people. She took me into her grave and the grave didn't have a headstone. I thought, oh, she's this famous person, she has got a headstone. And I said, and I was only a little boy, I said, Mum, how come Grandmother Smith has got a headstone? She said, Well, we'll look at the time they was robbing the graves. And they was too bright to put a headstone on her in case they robbed her grave because that was Billy Lanner, <coughs> Truganini, and, and herself was the last three that they recognised as tribal women. And they argued about her as well. Uh, whether she was Aboriginal or not. Um, so there was always this thing of silence within our family, not silence that was Aboriginal, but silence that where she was, so no one would take the, the remains. And then we was told when we got older that she wasn't in the in that uh, grave anyway because that was the, the grandsons was too bright that she's going to be taken. So they uh, so they buried her in another place and just took the coffin down and, and that's all the process. So we always had this hidden thing of not being recognised. And, and I always thought it was made me fairly sad. And I spent most of my life trying to get recognised through through um, not having a right for our culture. And I spent a fair bit of time uh, challenging that right, whether I did have a right to my culture. It cost me a fair bit of money, but it's in that system that Greg speaks up with that war system. And it wasn't a good place to, it took me a long time to work out. It was no place to go to discuss my politics. <laughs> it, was a, it wasn't a place where I could get uh, any joy out of the issues that I was dealing with. And it was about that silence of not being recognized not being recognised as being Aboriginal enough to practise our culture, was recognised enough to be recorded in the criminal system. <laughs> uh, but we, yeah, yeah, and I'd been going to court for a fair while, and one of the old judges, uh, his name was quite a horrible judge, at that time I suppose most of us were, said old bloke, and he was really mean, he was the meanest out of Matheson. Was it Matheson? Yeah, good. For, for my job, yeah. yeah. Anyway, this old bloke, he's, he's quite. Quite, um, I'd say quite horrible to deal with that anyway. Uh, I went up to him after the broadcast and said, I thought that you didn't like me, but the only bloke I've got in Tasmania who will record my history for me, so thank you. Uh, it was uh, unusual place to have your history recorded. And I think that all that way through of this, of the recognition and not being recognized in the Constitution and not, you know, just today. I had to do an interview today where they had a 11 year old boy. The police had an 11 year old boy in the Northern Territory, and they got him by the arm and the leg on both sides and thrown him in a in a uh, police coach in the back of that truck. He had done nothing wrong except he he ran away from where his foster people was and he got to get back to see his sister, and that's what he had done wrong. He went to see his sister, so they took police and family services. That's where we're up to in this country today. That's that happened just not long ago. So most of my life I've spent, like a lot of other people I have, trying to right these wrongs. And I see that having a voice in parliament, if we'd had a voice and we had someone that could go to the government and say, why are you doing this to this kid? Why is family services? Why is the police commissioner? Why is the ministers? They need they need to be brought before someone. At the moment, they brought before no one. They go and hide and say nothing. Leave it for three weeks and it blows over and something else more important comes along. So just even that, I wasn't going to talk about that, but I, I feel that that is an important step, that if we had a voice, we could stick up that voice. He's the most voiceless, vulnerable kid in this country, one of them. He's got no voice. So without that voice, I think that we're always going to struggle without the recognition. It gives me no glee. I know it's an old document, but it's an important document. It's important for us to be recognised. It's important for us to be recognised in the Constitution. It's also important for us to have a say.
God, I need my new game. Our people yeah. are in a terrible place in all those places. And they've put a shitload of money into those places to make changes, but they've made no change. So we think that having a voice in the parliament where they talk to the executive government about making change in this country for our people, it won't cure all the things that's happening today, but over a period of time, it will make it a whole lot better for us to try and close that gap. I feel that we talk about, some people talk about, this is going to cause division. We've already got division. We've got many divisions within politics. We've got Greens, we've got Independents, we've got Labour and Liberal. So we've got plenty of division within the country of politics. This is just to give those all those ones advice, all the divisions uh, advice. This is about bringing it together rather than dividing us. So I see that important steps and having a voice even here in Tasmania where we can have a say about the things that matter, about making those significant changes. So I think they're the important steps for me, and that's the reasons why I'm playing my role in, in a voice to parliament. I think it's the most one of the most important things I'll do in my lifetime. It's the only opportunity we've ever had with a government to, that wants to make change. And this government wants to make change. And I firmly believe that we can we can make change if we can get this voice up. And it's it is the most significant thing I'll do in my lifetime. And perhaps if I have a look around the room, it'll probably be the most significant thing that happens uh, in our era. I think that it's it's the most important thing I can see that I can do at the moment. We've got a bit of time. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I hope everybody online can hear me because we've got a, quite a few people there. So um, if you're having any problems hearing me, let me know. Um, I think I think more relevantly, which I didn't include in the bio, is that uh, I ran the 1999 Republic referendum <laughs> campaign. So I'll share with you some thoughts about this campaign and how depressingly it looks like uh, 1999 in terms of the way the no case is structured. but just to, to pick up some of the constitutional issues, because, you know, the, the and again, this is very much like 1999 with the Republic, the mythology, deliberate mythology and the lies which are peddled by the no case go something like this. Um, essentially that, uh, you know, if you tamper with the constitution, you make Australia unstable, uh, that uh, this will create a third tier of government, uh, that there'll be enormous amounts of litigation um, and, and you know, it'll end up in the courts uh, bogged down in, you know, uh, case law. But, so to pick apart each of those, the first, in, in relation to the, the last mentioned, we've had former High Court judges, Ken Hain, Robert French, the former Chief Justice, uh, and, and constitutional scholar Greg Craven, who's a Conservative, all say that that is a nonsense, that there will not be torrents of litigation as a result of the voice. And the reason they say that is because the voice will be enshrined in the constitution, but it is an advisory body. Um, it doesn't have any capacity to force government to do anything. Um, it, is, it is like, in some ways, like many other advisory bodies we've had, but we're putting it into the constitutional because it's fundamentally important to, to recognize Indigenous Australians in the Constitution, because there is no recognition of Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that the uh, people say, well, um, uh, why doesn't the, um, why, why don't you just simply have constitutional recognition? Why do you have to have a voice? Because um, in some ways, you know, constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australia is meaningless without having something, some flesh on the bones. Uh, if you don't create uh, a voice in the constitution, you simply have constitutional recognition. Uh, you know, in, in, in many ways, it's, it becomes meaningless, you know. Um, and the, the, you know, some people, of course, would go further than the voice. And the reason why some people are not backing the voice is because they say, including some leading figures in this state, 
they say that you know what you need is uh, you need a treaty, full full blown treaty between European and Australia and Indigenous Australia. Now there are a couple of responses to that. Uh, the first one is you can say yes, that would be uh, highly desirable, but it's not on the agenda. Um, and why would you vote down the voice, which actually is substantive progress in terms of constitutional recognition and laying the platform for future developments, future legal and constitutional developments? If you don't vote for this, you set back the cause a number of years. And let me tell you, in relation to the Republic, we had the same issue in 1999. Uh, you had people who were so-called direct electionists. They said, we don't like this model of a, essentially a parliamentary uh, appointed republic. Uh, what we want is is a direct vote for all Australians, and we made the point to them at that time, Malcolm Turnbull and myself and others. That, you know, this was a pipe dream. This idea that you could knock this one over and you'll get a better model next time. As we know, twenty four years later, we don't have a better model, uh, and we don't have a republic vote. So don't think that you know. Don't fall for what is what what is. Um, an emotionally, uh, the emotional blackmail and the lie which is peddled, which says, oh, if you vote this down, you'll get a better result. Uh, I mean, this is, this is just mythology. And it, they know it's a lie. Uh, and, and that's what's so, you know, troubling about it. The last thing I'd, I'd probably say at, at this juncture is that um, when it comes to the constitution, this idea that you can't change a constitution, that you should leave it the way it is, is something that set this country back, uh, you know, over generations now. We, as we know, we've only had seven out of 44 referenda, I think seven or eight out of 44 referenda have passed. Most of them have been mechanical. I mean, the last one to pass in Australia was dealing with the retirement age of judges and the number of senators in the territories. But, you know, constitutions are meant to be living documents. They're meant to be documents which reflect a nation <clears throat> at a particular point in time, not a nation that was established in 1901. And one of the problems with the Australian constitution is that in many respects, it does not reflect the nation who we are today. And th this is a modest proposal. I mean, it really is a modest proposal. Um, it's not creating any new rights it's not creating this idea that there's division. <clears throat> I mean, as Rodney says, division is part of democracy. We have, we have division. But not all di division is undesirable. But what you have now in terms of division is you have, you have a division between European Australia, which has all the benefits of a, a, a white imposed constitution from 1901. Um, and uh, you have those who are left behind, which is Indigenous Australia with no recognition in the constitution. Now, you know, this idea that, uh, that this will divide society is a nonsense because we know that uh, the voice uh, is, has got limited capacity. We also know that the voice is an advisory body. So this idea that you're gonna create some alternative parliament is, is just, again, a mythology, but it's a deliberate mythology which is being employed by a disreputable and discreditable, you know, uh, uh, lacking in credit, no case. So just to, to wrap that up, um, it's really important over the next few weeks that people stay positive and don't get deflected by, uh, you know, what is, what is a nasty campaign. You know, of course, there are people of, of genuine goodwill in the no campaign. There are people who've got concerns about constitutional reform. But by and large, this campaign, and we saw this, you know, I think, in the nine newspapers last week or the week before, I think it was last week, where we had an admission from Advance Australia, which is this shadowy group uh, that uh, if you go onto their website, you can't find any of their directors or any of their <laughs> personnel. Uh, so you've got this shadowy group, which is admitting, well, what we're doing is playing on people's emotions. We don't actually care about the Constitution. We don't actually care about ensuring justice and equity in, to be reflected in our uh, uh, bedrock document of our legal system. We just want to appeal to people's emotions because we don't like this particular proposal. 
So it's really important that, you know, you stay positive. And the last thing I'd say is that, you know, use it as an opportunity to educate people. You know, one of the difficulties with the constitution, I was just talking to someone earlier about this, is that people don't know what it is. You know, mainly because it's a really boring document and doesn't inspire anyone in Australia, so people don't read it. But it is, you know, of course, no cases feed into ignorance. They feed into the vacuum. And so it's really important when you're talking to people to keep this as a really simple message. This is about constitutional recognition and the creation of a body which gives voice to Rodney and other Australians. That's what it does. It does not create a new government. It does not create warfare between European Australia and Indigenous Australia. And most importantly, um, when it comes to the details of who's on the body and how it will operate, these are all details that are, you're not going to find in any constitution. These are all details to be worked through. But the essence of this body and its powers and what it can do and what it can't do are all set out for you in the yes case uh, if you bother to read what the Australian Electoral Commission has sent you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was, that was wonderful. Thanks very much for that uh, extensive overview of the constitutional issues involved in the voice campaign. Uh, brilliant. Um, then we're going to now move on to Matt Jeffrey. Uh, he's flown down from Sydney. He's a writer, musician, union activist, a student, secondary education at the University of Newcastle, and um, an advocate for social and economic justice. But I can let you want to introduce yourself further than that. Sure. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> It's going to make an inspiring, impassioned point for the guest so. vote. I hope so. Nice to see everybody here today uh, and on Zoom as well. Uh, good day to all of you. Yan Ma, Yan Ma Olivia, Naramura. It's Darug and Darawal for Come On, Let's Walk Together, Let Us See a Way Together. My name is Matt. I'm a writer, a student of teaching, and a Wadi Wadi man of the UN Nation in New South Wales. I'm so grateful to be given the chance to, be speak, to speak here about the importance of the next few weeks for the Yes campaign and the importance of the voice to you all today, about what it really means for the first peoples of our continent and this island. I'd like to acknowledge country, and I thank Rodney here for giving a welcome, and to acknowledge where we meet today, and to pay respect to elders past and present and emerging, and I understand that we all share a responsibility for custodianship of this place, whether we like to admit it in our day-to-day -day lives or not. I just wanted to begin with a, a short poem um, to contextualize my support for the voice and in the introductions being a creative and whatever else. Um, so uh, I wrote this poem uh, underneath the ferns uh, of my traditional lands over on top of the escarpment uh, overlooking the valley uh, around Otford uh, at the southern tip of the Royal National Park in New South Wales. And this was on the day that uh, Stan Grant was getting all that flack in the media uh, for uh, something to do with the crown and the king knighting business. So yeah, hopefully the poem's okay. Um, it's called Nah, No Sorries. Um, Conserific gnar over the cliff face of all of these sorries and sorries and sorries. The welts of bedding melting over my shoulders. Had a limerick spun courage with her oar of image. I sat there one day, was wadi and Weijin, as that Raradjuri journo was dealt his Sisyphean boulder. The wandi, the shadows, flickers asunder in this austere air. The grains then dug it, and the moon repeated the sun's glare. And at the very last, on my traditional lands, I felt a regulation not outer imposed. The degustation of our cultural sites can destroy a thousand emperors' clothes. In this year's campaign, the candles are at a wafer, and the nations just might. Yet they bite their hungers in anticipation. Naturally, the wicker jammed the wick of the summer and toned a gift encased in the winter's fold. Our sleeping spirit on that escarpment does not haunt people. It holds them. It overwhelms the armoured peoples with love and bellows to their, their fellow karma. Well, you're old, but you're not that old. Come and have a go if you think you're that hard enough. 
Why well, even biomy wasn't made of the right enough stuff. Our drops can stiffen the tantric, make them physical even. Add to that odds and the flavor of these gods, like two minute Maggie's microwave for the hippie to cook a cord prog. Shame hadn't entered. The two were in a garden, well, well, well guarded course. The recourse was promulgated there from and there forward, meted all roads lead back to the Roman Empire, to even those breathing deep our sleeping rock. When the natives upstart, understand it was always theirs, then wayfinding eels to chart up. A life cycle minnows, but our shoots carry the ancient heart of the country, where mirror rule and brother rain live inside each human brain, awashing the lucky continent's populace to ever healing lakes. It can't be quiet though, it has to be fought. The systems of the crown have to be dealt with and shorn. As the jumbucks and lifted and disappeared our economy, the flash in the gold pan Australia might glean its first senses aware. With rhythmic dismantlement and recreation, it can feed the spirit healing and shared liberation. I recently had a Wajin Biraba, that's a white lady. <laughs> Natalie, in my hand, she held close to the words of our motherland. She stored her mechanical and our Nasu opened her to dance. And after those moonlights we had, I've shed tears on many first lands. Because being reconciled doesn't just mean tokens. It means coming together broken, unbroken, and, un and broken again. It means dealing with the ephemeral Australia and fashioning values that can be generating embers. I often wondered about the monetization of my sacred birthing trees, a place where I could have never been born, or the mausoleum signage den denoting where my people so said used to be. We have for too long been made the past tense so as to destroy our dreams. And I think as past tense, we've realized that we've all been lean. It's not just stand up, get up. And it's not just elders. It's not just aunties and uncles and celebrations and the carving out of our own tenders. It is revolting the way that so many Aboriginal futures are stolen today. The only thing that is needed is a revolution of mind frame. So dustbin their ladders, their corporate hierarchies and titles, because they have us in their desolate June. The June that is attuned to is no longer a desolate tune. Harm healthy, Harold, well, I could sorely never sever, but harsher still is the coming, climate changing, dream time weather. So let us talk at least with the voice as it all goes extinct. My fellow travelers, first nation or not, I'd rather share my umbrella with you lot. Thanks for cool. listening. Thank you. Oh. All right. Um, can I share a few words from yes, speeches? Yes, right. please do. Yeah, and then we'll move. And yeah. we can move on. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah, and then we'll move to question and mm. answer after that. So is that okay? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go. Um, I just wanted to say a few quick things. Thank you so much for listening. Um, let us like not mince our words here, all right? Like the colonial project of Australia is only twenty-four decades long, but that's four sixty-year-olds next to each other the nation state is 1901 you mentioned that greg like it's two 65 year olds next to each other but when we hear this nonsense that we can't change the country or you can't make change look how fast it's changed in just two generations of actual humans next to each other you know there's one bloke born uh, on a Brisbane farm in 1910, and he lived until 2022. That means he lived in every single decade, apart from the first of the modern nation state. So to say, I think that there is a, a grave mistake that we all make in that we think that the, the weeks, uh, what we can accomplish in weeks or minutes or hours or one year, uh, is different to what we can accomplish in 10 or 60 or 80 years across the span of our entire lifetime. <clears throat> People move across centuries. The reason I want to start here is because it means only four generations of humans have shaped our present. So to say that the crown no longer has any power over us is an absolute bunkum. To say that we've made some kind of democracy well that's going to be an absolute bunkum because the first nations of this place of this island and the big island up north the australian continent we didn't get a, a, a say in the democracy neither did one representative of labor and neither did one woman 
It was all white men in trench coats and capitalists who decided the framing of our constitution. Corporations protected by the Crown's legislation and their original stamp descent came to these lands with the expressed invitation to establish British or European civilization. And what have they done? Well, they've extracted and destroyed our traditional lands. They destroy our rivers, they destroy our water sources. And ultimately, if you destroy water, you destroy all of our shared futures. I guess I'm saying this because the flip side is that a lot can happen within one actual generation of humans, that we can find community power. Just last Wednesday, or last week, I was in court with a couple of dozen friends because earlier in the year, I decided to fight the Crown's representatives for a non-conviction for an action I participated to stop dastardly new coal developments. And the following day, last Thursday, I marched with my fellow First Nations brothers and sisters, the Gomeroy peoples, with friends, with committed farmers, with the Country Women's Association, with Unions New South Wales, students and more on New South Wales Parliament, in opposition to the dastard Pilliga Narrabri Coal Seam Gas Project, a project that threatens to destroy 30% of New South Wales fresh water in the Great Artesian Basin. This is just to say that the function of colonialism has not left us. It doesn't matter if we change street signs. It doesn't matter if we pull down a statue or two. It is right on course. Economically, it is destroying the workers' packs that were made last century. And it is also intensifying in its inclination to dispossess Indigenous peoples of our society with the land and to dispossess all Australians of a living ecosystem. By voting yes for the voice, you could play one small part, one avenue for First Nations peoples across these vast lands and waterscapes to enjoy together in the power of communication to platform our truths more broadly to the Australian people about how to live with country instead of against it. It doesn't matter if the government chooses not to hear our 250 plus First Nations voices or ignores the advice. It only matters if the people can hear us by shifting more Australians to understand the reality of the current predicament we find ourselves in at this point of ecosphere, working rights and food web collapses, by sharing our cultural knowledges of the land or the kinds of philosophies needed to create societies that last 60,000 years or more and that continue despite the violence of colonisation, by being a willing accomplice to help fashion the voice we could together enlarge the political trajectory of the country. Sorry, do you want me to stop? No. Okay. Okay. Gonna... Do you want me to stop? No. Okay. No. Sorry. Please keep going. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This has all happened within four generations. These corporations have tightened their grip and they continue to tighten up their monopolies. There is hardly anything distinct about Australian capitalism. The corporations that came out here originally to enslave us, they enslaved the convicts, they enslaved the Pacific Islanders, the Kanakas, on the sugar refining companies up in Queensland, and through various, uh, through various Van Diemen's corporations, they also stole this land. It's a civilization built on bones and selling yourself to the stream of death for a minute of luxurious glory. It is only insofar as the appropriation of ever more and more wealth in the abstract, be, that, that, that becomes the sole motive of their operations, that they function as an extractivist capitalist, that is capital personified and endowed with a consciousness and will. The use values of fishing in our rivers and ecosystems, therefore, must never be looked on as the real aims of an extractivist or a capitalist. Their restless, never-ending process of profit-making off of a finite world alone is what they aim at, the boundless greed for riches. Why even today our penal settlement uses prisoners for almost free slave-like labor. They toil for three or four dollars an hour. This is part of why the voice for the first peoples is necessary because you've got some ramshackle progressive opinions out there that believe it must be antithetical to transforming our society. 
The voice is not in opposition to treaty making. It is not in opposition to land rights or land back. And it is not in opposition to a better future for all. It is in fact one mechanism by which greater structural power of media can help us generate real transformations in our society away from exploitation to assist in better, more equal treaty making and truth telling processes, says. Most of the fear mongering about the voice from the so-called progressive left and the lunatic right wing zealots revolves around this myth of creating a new Aboriginal elite. Dutton will describe it as the Keandra voice, despite all First Nations being able to elect or select representatives to it, from Arnhem Land to the southern tip of Tassie. Some so-called communists believe that the voice will be stacked with comprador Indigenous leaders. As if we don't already have comprador Indigenous leaders, the ones that tell us that colonialism has benefited us in the Conservative parties. It is easy to dispel their notions. Who has the biggest ear of government? Lobbyists? For private consultancy firms, democracy eaters, fossil fuel companies, weapons manufacturers, corporatists. In essence, the progressives tread the same lines as those arch conservatives, but the indigenous voices, we must all be similar to those lobby groups. But we're not. It's some future yet scenario, uh, some future scenario yet reality. Yet in reality, what they do is they infantilize us, that we somehow don't have the capacity to represent ourselves or our communities, that we will too be taken over by the private interest of the few. It too is a bunker, a classic thought bubble based in the invention of racism. We shouldn't allow the First Nations peoples a voice with which to lobby parliament, the government and the people of the country and with which to speak with each other. The mostly white settler bank of fossil fuel oligarch system should just remain in force. This imaginary Aboriginal elite is the boogeyman for the racist, whether they believe we're all too progressive or woke or conservatives in disguise. It has no backbones. The voice is structural reconciliations and set out in the Uluru Statement from the Heart is practical in changing reconciliations in the works along the path of voice, treaty and truth. No other continent. <laughs> I can stop yeah. yeah. No other continent and surrounding isles across the yeah. face of our earth are facing this opportunity. The voice, in its purest essence, will provide the First Nations the ability to express their truths, our identity, our ideas about legislation, and our future visions to the government and to the people. It could set Australia on a course that recognises that we were here long before Parliament and we will be here long after the parliaments. People are scared to connect things. But Labor has two referendums up its sleeves, this one and the Republic. The Voice and the Republic are intimately connected, despite anyone who tells you that they are, because the Crown hides its power. It has done its level best to hide what legal and economic systems it brought to this place and what it has done to our peoples. And what it has done to hide its power from the mindsets of the convicts and all other immigrants here since 1788. Land struggle, class struggle go hand in hand. <clears throat> Who was the first in the early 1900s to stand along my, my mob in the UN in land struggle? It was the communists, it was the unionists, it was the workers, it was the people. Yeah. They stood alongside us. So I say to you all today, with all the love that I can, get out and door knock for this thing. Get this thing over the line so that we could go a journey of independent nation making, a voice, republic, treaty, truth, so that we could fashion what our nation actually is. I'd like to leave you with two lines from one of my favorite songs. And it's a treaty by Yoti Yindi. The song. Bob Hawke promised Indigenous Peoples Treaty way back in 1988. So it is not a foreign political concept. Back in 1988, all them talking politicians, promises can disappear, just like writing in the sand. So let us not just write in the sand, but in the constitution of our body. Let us go the journey with mob and stand with us in our battles outside of this voice campaign. Because win or lose, we need each other more than the state. A future is always fought for collectively. 
<laughs> Very passionate. <laughs> passionate speech. Wonderful. Thanks, um, Matt. Um, we're now going to move into Q and A, which is going to be moderated by Paul Saint Vivian, our well, Tasmanian branch. So I'm going to turn over to you. Thank you. So, um, yeah. Good evening, Hobart, and good evening, Internet. Um, I've got a few questions that have come in from online, but perhaps uh, the audience have some questions first. If anyone has a question and wants to jump in now, otherwise I'll go to the online ones and you can always just raise your hand when you have something you'd want to ask. Okay, so from the online questions, the first couple relate very much to the constitution and the parliamentary aspects. And so Greg, I'm going to move sure. the camera over to you in a moment. Sure. Um, first of all, um, the very simple question or very basic question, why does it need to be in the Constitution? Why can't we just legislate it? Well, the, the reason for putting it in the Constitution is so that it's um, one, a greater recognition of its importance, um, uh, and two, uh, if you have simple legislation, it can be repealed by the next government, of course, uh, and that's what happens. And so it's important to keep it within the Constitution so that it's not easily tampered with. Um, but importantly, it, it recognises uh, in a fundamental way that uh, the body politic in this country is incomplete without uh, recognition of Indigenous Australia through the course um following on from that there's the question's been asked will the voice insert race into the constitution now of course race has been in the constitution from day one and was uh even more in the constitution after the 1967 referendums um but um what do you what do you feel about this idea of putting even more issues of a race into the constitution Shouldn't we perhaps be trying to take race out of it completely? Well, I don't think it, it, it does that. What it recognises is that the, the original uh, and ongoing uh, owners of this land are not recognised in the Constitution um, in any way. And this is an appropriate mechanism for doing it. And in line with uh, what the United Nations has said, on a number of occasions through a variety of treaties, and that is that constitutional recognition of Indigenous peoples of lands is fundamentally important and uh, a matter of human rights. So I see it more in the framework of human rights rather than seeing it in terms of race. Okay, so the next question is, is really for all of our panellists, um, and, and that is that by... Um, doing this by making this change to the constitution are we favoring one race um, and um, counteracting the idea that everyone is equal and all races therefore are equal well i might start with that uh, it doesn't do that at all because uh, all that the voice is recognizing is that in our constitutional structure in Australia, we have ignored the fact that uh, we have in this country, uh, as I say, the original owners of land. We've reflected it partly through case law, through the decision in Marbo. Um, we've reflected it in native title legislation. And so all we're doing really is institutionalizing some of that recognition through the voice doesn't create in any way a first class tier of citizens or a second class tier of citizens. What it does do is reflect this as a former colony in the same way that uh, you, know, you, you have, you know, uh, in New Zealand, in Canada, in the United States, South Africa, you know, any nation where you've got um, dispossession uh, and a colonial construct, it's appropriate as a matter of law uh, and as a matter of um, 
in terms of liberal democracy for there to be explicit recognition. So that's not creating anything new. It's simply recognizing that equality takes many forms. Mm -hmm. I think also, Greg, it, it recognizes the oldest living culture in the world. Yeah. And I think that we as a country should be proud of that um, and not condemning it mm -hmm. and encouraging it, uh, that we all go along with that and, and think about the importance when we've not been recognized where we sit in the social structures in this lands, in the lands of the richest people in the world mm. with the most ancient culture, the ancient art, the ancient music, all those things that we had that was taken from us. This will recognize that in our constitution of where we've come from to where we're going. This is a country that is starting to mature. Like you said, brother, it's only 200 years old, but you can count that on. If we put it on a ruler across the room for 60,000 years, it only yeah, yeah. it's only a little Tiny clip. in the corner. So I think that it's recognising that for us all to come together and share the country together. That's what this is about. Recognition in the Constitution is only that. So um, one of the questions that's, that's come up is, how the voice can actually help close the gap. Um, and also as a, a, a sub question to that, especially considering that so many of the issues, the gap issues are actually state matters. So the Commonwealth gives the states money to address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. When the states get that money, it becomes their sovereign money and they don't always spend it where they're supposed to. Yeah. So it's as simple as making the states accountable for the money that they say they're going to spend the money on. And I think having this group working with the executive government to say, mm -hmm. if we're putting $1.6 in into Northern Territory for housing, perhaps we might put it into housing. Uh, if we have a look at how many houses need to be built, how many homeless people, that we've got 20 people and 30 people living in a house, perhaps it will address some of those issues. And we could make a count also on the 10 years that we live less than anyone else. We could also make a count on the school and education. We've got systems where Aboriginal kids in Alice Springs can learn 250 dreaming stories to get from Alice Springs to Broome they can learn every one of them in the right order, yet we can't teach them ABC. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's things that we haven't been able to do well in this country. And I think that having a voice will help us make those changes, will help also make these people accountable for the money and spend the money where it was supposed to be spent. Mm -hmm. The Commonwealth is putting money into these areas. And like Commonwealth has said, they're not going to put any more money into it. But the money they put in there, they want to make people accountable for it and have achievable outcomes that, that can be recognised. Because at the moment, the money that's going in, there's nothing coming out. We're, and we can use an example. We spend a million dollars to keep a juvenile in a prison mm. for a year. A million dollars to keep one kid in a prison for a year. Surely we can come up with a better system than yeah. that. Surely we can. And I just want to add on that, like prison rates, you know, First Nations kids and adults are proportionally the most incarcerated people on the earth. And it's a design feature of colonialism to you, 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 you change the law, you introduce a new way of life, you just try attempt to destroy old ways of life. And then you say to people that your current way of living is no longer legal anymore i'm sorry like it's it's and i think that with with a voice we can articulate these things that the the current prison system doubly privatized you know you've got a private prison and then you've got a disproportionate amount of aboriginal brothers and sisters and young people working in these prisons for private companies as well so we're paying millions of dollars for our aboriginal brothers and sisters to sit in there and make millions of dollars in profits for other people, and we don't get that into in the community. And it's often billed as training or 
work experience or something like this or but it, it there are so many better systems re make at least make prisons public again and and stop with this waste of millions of dollars it, we're not going to be able to solve issues around closing the gap without a voice and i think that the voice is paramount to ensuring that we you know articulate what systems in the 20th century did work in terms of the public welfare state and what systems new systems we could develop could work in the future i've got a, a couple of more questions here that are very much related to the structure and the workings uh, and the political side of things um so greg i guess you're going to to jump in on, on sure. this because as you mentioned uh, of course the referendum is not providing a lot of detail a lot of the detail is to be worked out later um, in legislative form um, so yeah let's start with that question actually how will the details be decided could it end up getting out of control and becoming something we're not expecting now in in reading that question i do have to acknowledge that everything that we see here today is what uh the first peoples of this nation of, of the continent and the islands of australia were not expecting but that's not the question being asked right now so what's the danger and how will the details be decided well the details will be decided through ordinary legislation so you don't use your constitution to set out in detail mm. Uh, the way in which uh, or the mechanical operation of institutions. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, the High Court, which is, of course, the judiciary, which the power which is set out in the Constitution, doesn't give you chapter and verse on the way in which the High Court operates. So, what is jurisdiction? Jurisdiction of federal courts. That's a matter of ordinary legislation. It's the High Court Act and, and it's the federal court. Uh, and the judiciary so it's it, it's the same here all these people say oh well you know what are the details the details will be in the form of legislation this idea that it's going to be this sort of rampant out of control body you know you've got to get it through the parliament so if anything it's likely to be more hamstrung than, than, uh, than radical in any way um, but it, it is not the place of constitution to embed structures uh, and detail. That is the that is the role of ordinary legislation. Can I can I add one thing? There's also the there is a a voice working group with the government, and they have come up with a set of design principles for the voice to guide yeah. future legislation. So the government doesn't have to listen to these principles that were announced, I think in April or May earlier this year, but find those design principles and have a look at them because that'll probably guide at least some of the legislation. Yeah. There seems to be a, a, um, a theme of fear about this concept of the voice to parliament and the voice to government. Um, and one of the questions that's been asked is why not just a voice to parliament? And I remember when um, the wording was announced and the and executive government, a lot of people were saying that maybe this was actually going to cost cost us the yes vote. The question that's being asked is, does this mean that the opposition, and I guess we can also imply then the independents as well, uh, so the non-governing parties might not have a say in certain policy decisions. Um, I guess this comes down to how is it going to work and what will its actual influence and power be? What are the limits? <laughs> Look, I think we've lived on fear and we've dined out on fear for a long time. <laughs> we had we had uh, little Johnny Howe uh, talk about native title and talk about that Aboriginals was going to take, take people's back fence. <laughs> well, the only people in this country that took land was the white people. Aboriginal people didn't take land off the white people. So that fear that's been going on in this country and boiling up for quite some time, who was the next one? Tony Abbott had fear. What was that over that was going to invade and take over our lands again? 
what was his that was over he had a be in his bonnet at one stage he had thought that Aboriginal people was gonna once again take over. We have never ever done that. Yeah, it's the apology. Yeah, that's right. So the, the apology, apology was yeah. going to be a threat that was gonna um block up the court system forever. Yeah. In claims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Block up the court system forever in claims. So I think all these things, all we're asking is a voice to make change, a voice for the voiceless. This is a lobby group that's going to go, not unlike what you talked about in your poem, this is a lobby group that's going to go and lobby the executive government to say, can you do this, to give advice. All we are is advice, nothing else but advice. So all the threats that come out are threats that are made by people in their minds. They're not, this is not, this is about addressing the issues. We're not there to worry about the other things. We don't care about where they park their new nuclear submarines. We don't care about where they park whatever they've got in the park. This is about addressing the issues of housing, health, education, employment. This is what this is about. It's not about anything else but that. And if people can't see that, then we are going to struggle as a country to try and go ahead and address them. We may never close this gap and we may never come together as a country. And I think I just want to add what what I mentioned before about the other referendum stuff. It it's it's not to take away from this current referendum at all. It's to say that this is yet another moment in which the Australian people may be so demoralized as to not try and do anything in their future again. You know, it like it it I think that we should be warm enough to the idea that constitutional reform is okay. That, uh, as I think, I think Noel Pearson has said a couple of times, you know, it, <laughs> this constitution wasn't laying, laying down by Moses. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it didn't come with, <laughs> it didn't come from uh, a God or something. It, it is something that people should be able to change and transform as it goes along, as we go along. And I, I, I wanted to impress tonight tonight that a lot more probably rests on the referendum being successful than we probably realise that we do have an opportunity to put the country at least onto a different footing. That is listening for advice. The, the, the question about executive government being too much or something, it's bullshit. You need to be able to talk to the executive government because they're the bureaucrats that are implementing the government's agenda. You need to be able to talk to the people that have the levers of control over the direction of money and the direction um, of policy agenda as well. So one of the, the questions that's being asked, and, and I'm sure we've all heard it, heard the question asked, but it would be nice to hear a response to it, um, is there, along the lines of there are already, um, I think one count says 11 um, Indigenous uh, senators and MPs in the federal parliament already isn't that already a voice they are being heard why do we need something else how and how have they gone along all right they're close <laughs> to that. they've done okay <laughs> I I am I'm not asking the question I'm just asking the question we're not well, in your battle that no, already no I'm not I'm just I'm Someone just uh, answering yeah, the question no, in, in a very sarcastic way, but and I'm not a sarcastic person, but they rely on the policies of the of the Labor Party or the Liberal Party or the Greens that they run through. They have got to try and get something up. Like you've got the Black Caucus, which works a bit to help us, but we've got nothing else. Mm. Anyone in the Liberal Party or anyone in the Greens or the Labor Party. They're controlled by that mechanism. And if they go outside that, they're either the whatever you call them at the next election. What do you call it when you get the disendorsed? Oh, dis 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 That's a good word, Rick. I'm glad you brought that up. Did it? Yeah. <laughs> disendorsed. So that's, you know, that's what we run under. And they haven't done, they haven't done well by us. We've had people in there for a fair while and we're still not closing the gap. We're talking about close. We want to close this gap. We want to live 
the same amount of time as everyone else. Mm. We want our kids going to school and getting educated the same as everyone else. We want some employment for our people like everyone else. We want all these things. Surely it's not hard to ask to be equal mm. in, a, in our own country. And I think as well, like a senatorial or a, these borders as well, they, they don't line up fucking perfectly with First Nations borders, do they? Or First Nations territory? Of course they don't. So it is also another thing to consider is that the, the, the electorates, federal, state, or the councils, they're all decided by others. They haven't been decided really by First Nations people and they don't marry up exactly with where, you know, you can have three senators from, or, you know, two Indigenous senators in one, you know, state. And that's great, but there might be 100 or 80 First Nations within that one state. It doesn't, there is no way that they could ever in a parliamentary system of democracy, totally reflect the voices of all of those communities. And also, this is a fairly big country, and I don't know how many politicians we've got in it, but they can't represent us and get round it. <laughs> already. How, already. So how are we going to do it and rely on 11 people? Yeah. yeah. So we've got a couple more very interesting uh, questions and, and um, reflections coming up in the chat, but we have a local question so can you just speak very loudly please yes similar line and um, when i was reading my little note pamphlet and um, it talks about and um, they're already being aboriginal advisory groups is including there was one that was done in to, to, to the tune of millions of dollars i was just wondering if you could talk to the difference between that what what that body does and, and what I wonder what body that is. Is that NIAA? Yeah, the National Agency. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then it's a bureaucracy. It's a bureaucracy. It's not, it's not, no, and we don't have a say in it. NIAA has been around for a while and we don't have a say in what they do or what they say. That's a bit like when the uh, the first minister for women was appointed and it was a man. Yeah. That's funny, yeah. but can you have it? Yeah. There you go. I didn't and want to mention yeah. his name again. In his bunch of smugglers. Yeah. What more would we want? Eating an onion. <laughs> so um, a question here that's come up in the in the chat online. Um, would you agree that the voice embeds affirmative action in the constitution? And that the premise is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will always be separate and different. Leading on from that, are Indigenous people not a part of the melting pot of multicultural groups? Well, um, from you know, from a legal point of view, uh, it doesn't do that at all. Uh, I keep coming back to what I said. It simply recognises that. There is in this continent, uh, there are in this continent people who were here when Europeans invaded the place uh, and who have been dispossessed uh, and in respect of which, you know, colonialism has had disastrous consequences, but also who have a series of um, traditions uh, including laws, L-O-R-E-S, uh, that are not easily rec reconciled uh, always with European law. And, you know, you've only got to look at the extraordinarily high, worst in the world, incarceration rates of Indigenous Australians and the refusal to, of the white system to recognise uh, a role for Aboriginal justice, uh, with the exception of Victoria, where the Koori Court is. Mm. But... Um, so I, I don't think it does that. It, that doesn't create a separation at all. It's simply saying this is an advisory body which is there to inform executive government and the parliament in relation to matters concerning Indigenous Australia. I mean, I don't see what's objectionable about it. Um, it, it, it. It's not in any way saying that they have any further, any more rights. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, it's simply, in, in fact, in the eyes of many, it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't do that, you know, but it doesn't in any way accord uh, an Indigenous Australian 
any more rights under the constitution than any of us has. My own thought on that, if I, if I may, um, I recently saw a, a rather tragic meme relating to the environmental situation. You know, um, uh, 200,000 years of humanity, we're doing good. There are still uh, seven habitable planets in our solar system. And um, then thinking back to, to what Uncle Rodney, to, to your comment, how they're going with that with the parliament, um, thinking how are we going with that with looking after this country? Um, and rather than, personally for me, my response to this question was when I read it, well, it's not about saying these people are separate. It's about saying these people have been here for 65,000 years and they know how it works. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should listen to them for all of our sakes as well as for this. Takes sometimes it takes a disaster of great sorts <laughs> before we recognize Aboriginal people, whether it's in fire or climate. True. And I think that we yeah. may um, here in Tasmania, we may enter that in the next in the next three to four months. Yeah, the, 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 lack of, the lack of understanding if this place, if you see the wind that was here today from the climate. If we have fires, even today, we'd have disasters here in this place. And I think that understanding understanding how this place works for so long and seeing this, I don't want to predict, but certainly I fear for this state or climate for the next two years on what's going to happen here. I honestly do. Um, and that's, that's beside the voice, but that's... Um, Certainly something just as an observer, as, a, as an Aboriginal person who's just hung around the hills here for quite a while in my life, I worry about what we've got here, we've got today in this state. It's a, yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's not some inferiority thing, you know, like, as is, as is in, in, implied by the, the question in, in a weird way. It's, it's not about embedding you know, that we're always going to be behind the, the cue ball on, on equality, something like that. I think that that's not what the voice implies. It, it implies that we give advice to the government on legislation. So what, you know, maybe in 10 parliaments or 12 parliaments time, we've achieved equality. Okay. In, in, in most outcomes. Okay, cool. Maybe there's still a role that we could play whether it is with climate disaster mitigation and or other things, that our advice to the government is still worthwhile. It doesn't specify that the advice just has to be about us closing the gap, but that's what we're focusing on because that is the, the, the meat of it. But it's recognising that we have our own cultural worth and cultural right to exist outside of our use value to the government and to the people. I think that that's that's the 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 most compelling part of the amendment is that it just simply says advice. We can be advising the government on so many things, and they would do so much better for it. I think I see. I travel a bit around this country, and when I go to Alice Springs, if you go to the hospital in Alice Springs, it's like a war hospital. Mm. People are coming out there. Amputees are coming out of there. I, I feel very sad for my people when I see we could address sugar diabetes, cardiovascular, we could address all those health issues in this country in a very short amount of time if we could give this government some advice on how to do that. And I think that if we could get to that stage where we could help make change for that, we not only help ourselves, but we'll, we'll help the country as well. So mm. I see this advice is not just about um, being a parliamentary privilege thing. This is about about helping our people that are in need. Mm. This is the most voiceless people in this country trying to get a voice. Yeah. So there's been a, a, a question asked here and I'm actually going to be cheeky and take the liberty of just saying yes. The question is, does the voice to parliament um, present benefits for non-Indigenous Australians as well. I think we would all agree, yes, it does. Yeah. Um, 
I'd yes. like, if it's okay, to elaborate on why. Well, the elaborating on why, I think, is what we've just heard. Um, well, if you so, want to live in a yeah. society where you've got greater equality, where you don't have a huge gap between Indigenous Australians and the rest of Australia, support the voice because you've got a better opportunity to do that. Uh, I don't I don't think I, I don't understand the opposition people are always in democracy, of course entitled to their view, but I have not heard one rational, really rational, uh, and sensible explanation for opposition to it. I really haven't. The only the only opposition to it that I can that I can relate to because I saw this in the Republican campaign for those who say it doesn't go far enough and they want more. I can understand that. But in terms of opposition to it uh, from you know a conservative perspective, it just seems to me to be pure sophistry. Mm. Really pure mm. sophistry. Mm. There is not one sensible uh, way in which one could articulate a conservative case against it. You know, when I see former High Court judges like Robert French and Ken Hayne, there were no radicals <laughs> supporting them. I think we should all be very comfortable. <laughs> okay. I'm just con very conscious of the time. Yeah. And I do have a couple more questions that I'd like to get in from uh, the online audience. And if anyone else here does. Two more. Yeah, two more. Yeah, two more. Yeah. So the first one, um, the short one, hopefully we can have a pretty much a yes, no answer to that. So I can go on to the long one. Um, why don't it cost more money? No. No. Right. Good. Think of the savings in closing the gap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, Tony, Tony Burke got up the other day and said a similar thing to another question. Why don't it cost Australians more money to pay the lowest paid workers a little bit more for No. Yes, slavery would be, it's not about that. And by providing direct advice, you know, we can cut out middlemen. We can cut out, as you're saying, brother, like this, this, this unimaginable waste of money that's being thrown about the place. By going to the source directly, you, you're you able to direct the money better. It is okay. and way also, cheaper. Also, of course, with the, the benefits that we were we were talking about mm -hmm. before that that spread to the whole community, um, including such things as, as the wisdom of the the ages uh, that could help us to manage things in this country yeah. can ultimately save us money. So now for the big one, which is more really a a, a very reflective comment um, from someone in the audience, and um, maybe there are just some closing thoughts. Uh, a few closing words from each of our three speakers that could respond to this. Okay. Uh, so bear with me, I'm going to try and read it so that it doesn't sound like it's just being read. Our parliamentary decisions are hugely shaped by lobbying. The most listened to lobbyists are often those with the most money to throw at convincing the public of their case. Parliament is already a very uneven listener especially considering democracy is supposed to be based on one vote, one value, and equal representation. So right now, the people with the biggest megaphone are the vested interests who stand to make a lot of money from their political interventions. Indigenous people are about 3% of the population. A good number of them are very poor. Their chances of being held, heard on a very uneven playing field are very small. With a voice, some politicians will listen. Closing thoughts in response to that. Great. Well, I, I agree. I mean, you know, that's the whole idea. The whole idea is to try and recalibrate the power of this country uh, and give a voice to Indigenous people of this country, which is completely in keeping with what's happening around the world in other jurisdictions and, and as it should be. I think this is a gift from Aboriginal people. This is the smallest thing that we could give to get over the line. Mm. And I think to, to give that gift of what to just give advice about the issues that affect us. That's just all I want to say. Um, um, you don't have to. I do. <laughs> I always want to speak, brother. Um, 
I just want to say, I think it, yeah, it is a gift and it is a gracious, you know, invitation. And it is also about fashioning better communities and senses of self. I, I, I think that that, you, 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 they mentioned megaphone, right? Like that's what I always bang on about. Like, yeah, the people who have had the biggest megaphones since coming here, are the people who have owned media companies. We need a power of media that is at least on par to even begin to stymie and stem the effects of racism and colonialism and, and reach equality in the country and, and become a better multicultural society. There is, there is no way that we can achieve our ambition to become a multicultural society if we don't invite the First Nations peoples of this place to the table to speak to the government and to the people. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'd like to thank our three speakers and our online audience and our audience here at Hope and Anchor in Hobart, which is, I believe, the oldest licensed hostelry <laughs> in the country. That's the big boast they made. Um, and I'm going to hand back to our national chair, Dr. Sarah. Oh, doctor, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, for it. Yeah, I did actually five years. Um, thank you very much again for, um, for that um, fantastic four speak three speakers who have given us so much tonight to enable us to understand better uh, the voice referendum and our decision in voting. And I thank the audience for coming along tonight, everyone who joined us on the online Zoom. Uh, and I'd like to just please put your hands together to thank my wonderful panel. So that brings Thanks, Thank you. the okay. conclusion. Sorry. Please volunteer. Oh, 25 days. Yes, sorry. I've worked for Marta. 23.com. All right. Comes it up. A word from Marta. Sorry about that. Hey. Yes, campaign. Hi, everyone. Hey, hi, thank you very much to Uncle Rodney for your continued leadership in this. Um, I've been reminded by a couple of people here tonight that it's been at least 10 years that we've been together talking about constitutional reform. And here we are in 25 days, all of us are gonna be asked to vote, yes or no, yes, on whether we recognize the truth of our history and 65,000 years of culture that should shine through as a fuller expression of our nationhood and whether there should be a voice into decision making about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's pretty simple. It is a practical idea to get better outcomes. And as we've talked about already tonight in a referendum, it is, it's a simple numbers game. We need a majority of Australians to vote yes. Sure. And we need a majority of the states that includes hopefully all the six of your states. And if you're in a territory, we still want the majority of your fellow territorians to vote yes. There's a lot of people who haven't decided yet. There's a lot of people still who don't know what it's about. Every single day that you can have a conversation is gonna make a difference. You can help us to win. Have the positive conversations, pick up a flyer like this from the Yes campaign and get one from the Australian Electoral Commission. The words that we're being asked to add to our constitution are published far and wide. They are simple, they're easy to understand. Talk to everybody that you know, persuade people to vote yes, and we will get it across the line. Go to yes23.com.au forward slash volunteer and sign up if you haven't yet uh, and get out there amongst it. It's there to win. Thanks. Thank